Welcome back to Blame Theory, the podcast that takes a seriously playful look at the ideas that have shaped our minds and our world to ask how have we ended up here and whom or what can we blame. I'm Jeff Schulenberger, and today I'm joined by David Dudrick, who's a professor of philosophy at Colgate University and recently contributed a piece to Compact called Why Foucault Couldn't Kill Sexuality. So this is the third and probably for the moment last installment of a, a series on Foucault, who's often the target of, of blame and various kinds of blame narratives that we've discussed. And uh, David's essay on Foucault, which came out around the same time as the, the 40th anniversary of his death, you know, was is focused on the legacy of his ideas and how they have and haven't uh, had an impact. So uh, thanks for, for joining me, David. Oh, it's a pleasure to be here, Jeff. Thank you very much for having me. And just to start, um, perhaps you could introduce yourself in terms of what your, your work, I mean, you are a, a philosopher, a professor of philosophy, focused on continental philosophy. Perhaps you could explain a little bit what your work has been about and, and how you've approached Foucault or how Foucault has fit into that. Yeah, thanks. So, so um, I guess I got interested in, in Foucault through my interest in Nietzsche in some ways. And I got interested in Nietzsche because I, um, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm Catholic and I'm a philosopher and I, I thought Nietzsche was fabulous because he took uh, Christianity so incredibly seriously. You know, he was like, um, uh, obviously opposed to it, thought that it was the worst idea that humanity had ever invented, but it, it really drew me to, to want to, to read Nietzsche and to think him through. Um, I guess I was, I was drawn to, uh, Foucault as, as someone who inherited Nietzsche's legacy, but who, um, it's, it, it seemed to me, um, in a very striking way was not himself at all in, in, at least in my initial reading. Um, and, and maybe in my subsequent reading, actually like opposed to Christianity in the same virulent way that, uh, Nietzsche was. So if, if Nietzsche wrote, um, you know, to vanquish the shadow of the dead God of Christianity, it seemed like Foucault sort of thought that Nietzsche had done that. And, and now we're kind of moving on. And if anything, it seemed to me he was trying to vanquish, the shadow of the dead God of something like humanism or something like that, something like the, the, of, of, of the man, the notion of man that had come to replace the notion of God. He, he wanted to um, do to that what Nietzsche had done to the Christian idea of God. And, and I found that to be fascinating and compelling. Yeah, that is a Extremely interesting point that that Nietzsche, um, you know, obviously is kind of animated by this deep antagonism towards Christianity, right? As he formulates it, you know, Dionysus, with whom he identifies himself, versus the crucified. On the other hand, yeah. in his in his most uh, kind of deranged final writings, he <laughs> ends up referring to himself as the crucified Dionysus a few times. Um, but in any case, yeah, it, it, it it's. Interesting what you say there that, you know, in some sense, Foucault, he, I mean, he does write in the end quite a bit about early Christianity in his, in his later works. He writes, mm. I mean, he, he, in the history of sexuality, he writes a great deal about the confessional uh, as a sort of seminal, modern, interestingly modern institution, right? An institution yes. that sees us kind of bringing about modern subjectivity. And then as yes. he as he goes through uh, the history of sexuality, he's actually ultimately focused quite a bit on the early church fathers. Um, but as you said, he's you know he he's not uh, he's not quite animated by this this sort of jihad against <laughs> Christianity. <laughs> no, that's that, exactly that, right. That, that Nietzsche is um, he sees it <laughs> seemingly as a more ambivalent sort of phenomenon, but also as something that, you know, perhaps has already been defeated and replaced by something else in his assessment and therefore no longer quite in need of the same uh, unrelenting hostility, which, as you say, I think he turns more towards humanism, you know, and, and as he's generally understood as sort of a critic of, of the enlightenment of sort of modern institutions, sure. 
you know, whether scientific institutions, medical institutions, uh, the judicial system, all of these, these fruits of sort of enlightenment, liberal reforms, secularization, right? These are sort of more what he, yeah. what he, what he targets. And so his, his battle is more with humanism and with this figure of man, right? Which he sees as, you know, as this kind of evanescent construction, right? Which as in one very memorable passage, he imagines kind of being washed away, you know, like a sort of, um, like a footprint in the sand being sort of washed away by the ocean. Uh, Absolutely. And, and, and so he's, you know, he's, he's, I, I, as you said, I think kind of continuing the Nietzschean project of kind of deconstruction, but, or, but directed at a, a different, I mean, and, and that's not saying, I mean, of course, Nietzsche is, is in a way targeting these modern secular institutions precisely insofar as he sees them as the inheritors of, of Christianity. Um, but, but Foucault, you know, then kind of takes up this, this project. And so, yeah, I, I think your, your piece focuses on his account of sexuality and, and, you know, he interestingly is, is often seen as sort of a progenitor of, of various sort of intellectual and cultural developments that conservatives tend not to like the Christians tend not to like, um, right. You know, and, and, and part of that is his own sort of personal libertinism is, is often kind of taken up and, and, uh, seen as, as a, I mean, it's, it's always striking to me that he, he dies of, of AIDS relatively early in the AIDS crisis. Um, these kind of myths spread around him that he, was, uh, you know, knew he was infected and was continuing to, you know, engage in, in, uh, sex and in bathhouses right. and so on. And, you know, this, I mean, there, there's been debate about this point, but I mean, what, what seems indisputable is that it sort of serves as a metaphor for the idea of him as a kind of intellectual super spreader, right? Somebody who's like, absolutely, uh, <laughs> who's like, uh, shows up and kind of contaminates and, and spreads these these nefarious ideas according to the the standard conservative account. So, I mean, I'm curious, you know, just because we're we're focused on these blame narratives, what your assessment has has generally been of that that kind of set of narratives around him. You know, I, I tend to think that um, while while certainly there have been. Um, thinkers who've taken up Foucault's ideas and taken them in very different directions than Foucault, that Foucault himself is, is much more, as you, as you said, ambivalent or, or much more difficult a, a thinker to, to categorize. Um, and, and one who it, it, it's a little bit more difficult to blame um, just because I, I do think that um, I can remember I can remember uh, teaching a seminar once and and having students who were very excited about reading Foucault, and uh, I think they they brought to the reading a certain expectation that Foucault was going to be saying the kinds of the kinds of things they wanted to hear, and after we sort of read Foucault, I, I got some comments back saying, you know, look, it's obvious that Dudrick doesn't really like really like Foucault. He does not really like he doesn't love Foucault. He doesn't have any kind of and, and I think the reason was I was actually trying to read the texts. You know, I was trying to read what he actually said um, and, and not sort of, you know, go on the vibes that, that surround Foucault. I, I think that um, I think his ambivalence even extends to um, to Christianity in some ways, as, as you had said. I think that Nietzsche, you know, in, in the way that Nietzsche, um, Nietzsche probably has some ambivalence about uh, master morality or, or the noble morality that preceded slave morality. It's not as though I think it's a, it's not a really very good reason reading of Nietzsche to think, Oh, Nietzsche plunks for, for master morality over and against slave morality. It's not that, but he does, he does give you a picture of slave morality that makes you think like, wow, things could be different. And there were, they were different. And there were some things about that other way that were like pretty good. Like, and I do, I kind of tend to think that, Foucault in, in, um, in, in, you know, the, these, these very famous, um, 
juxtapositions of the of the classical age, so called classical age, over and against the what we have now. He kind of gives you a sense of of an age where this classical age that that's infused with with kind of often with sort of Christian practices, where it's not so much that you uh, that you, that he's saying, yeah, that was better, uh, full stop. But you do get this kind of sense that, well, thing, things were different. And in some ways, there were aspects of it that were, that were better or, or allowed for more freedom. And, and I'm not sure that he thinks, I'm not sure if Foucault thinks that man can survive. You know, one of the things I think he, I think he wonders is, as, as you said about liberalism, liberalism being the sort of child of, of Christianity, I, I do wonder, I do sometimes think in, in some moods, I think, that Foucault thinks that man just can't survive the death of God, you know, that, that there is no humanism without some kind of theism. And so on those scores, I would say, you know, those are reasons that, that, um, you know, Christians and conservatives might, um, might want to see in Foucault something more than, than simply an object of blame. That said, I do think that he, that Foucault's critique of liberalism doesn't issue in a kind of it certainly isn't reactionary and and it's not even sort of you know pointing us toward the virtues or something like that it's more saying it's pointing in such a such a, a direction that can seem like just so crazy that like it, it's hard to take it fully seriously and so people kind of I, I think that people who he's influenced have sort of um stood at the edge of the abyss and sort of said, well, no, we can't, we can't do that. Um, so he must be saying something, you know, sort of less, uh, less extreme. When in fact, as with this claim that, that we should embrace not sexual identity and not even sex, but bodies and pleasures, that really does seem to be what he's saying, you know, something that is beyond, um, uh, you know, just, just, beyond the pale in, in, in some ways. I don't know that that's, that that's where, I don't know how, I don't know that that's had a, a great influence because it seems like instead we get some kind of mishmash of, uh, you know, progressive ideas and, and things that Foucault actually thought. So, I mean, it's, it's probably, I mean, it, it makes sense to me. I think um, he, he, so, I mean, getting into the point about sexuality, yeah. your, piece, your piece kind of takes up the way that, <coughs> and I, I brought this up in a previous episode, but the basic, uh, I mean, it's, it's always surprising to me, right? Because the first volume of the history of sexuality lays this out pretty clearly. Uh, you know, it's, it's a critique of what, what he calls the repressive hypothesis, which is simply the idea that uh, we you know, labor under and have labored under a sort of regime of sexual repression that uh, prevents the kind of full realization of our um, sexuality. And therefore, you know, we need to be in some sense liberated from this. So it's, it's really, it, it kind of targets yep. in a sense, the, the basic narrative of like the sexual revolution, right. Um, that, you know, if, I mean, if we can extend it back to the Victorian era, we can think of the 1950s, you know, that, that there is this period in which there is a kind of, um, you know, a, a sort of collective phobia around sex that, you know, uh, prevents it from being realized and therefore, um, you know, liberation will take the form of simply kind of releasing these, these repressive forces. So what he argues there is simply that this narrative isn't true, right? That, that, um, that there, that we, ha in a sense that we have never been repressed, right? That, right. That, that this whole idea of repression is, is a kind of myth and that, you know, even extending back to what we would think of as indisputably repressive contexts, like say, you know, counter-reformation Catholic, uh, societies, right? That, yeah. you know, that here we have this, and and this is where I think this institution of the confessional becomes quite yes. important. So I'm curious, you know, be, I mean, because you said you partly sort of initially approached this as a, a Catholic who is interested in, you know, engaging with Nietzsche's critique of Christianity and, and the seriousness of which he took it. 
Um, I'm curious, you know, how you uh, how you think about that, you know, particular focus he, he lays on the Catholic confessional as this kind of seminal institution. Well, I, you know, first, I just want to say, I think your, your discussion of the repressive hypothesis in that earlier blame theory was what inspired me to write the piece <laughs> uh, in, in compact, because I thought it was I thought it was brilliant and that it, it, it should just be emphasized in some ways, because I do think that um, I, I know that when I teach the book, you know, and students students are, are reading that they, those who know anything about Foucault cannot imagine that he is critiquing the repressive hypothesis rather than putting it forward as his own because they think that Foucault must be saying that you ought to express your uh, sexuality and express express your sexuality in language and talk about your sexuality and be out and sort of wh- wh- whatever it is. And, and they, they just can't imagine that, that he's – He's actually sort of mocking the repressive hypothesis. So, so I, I think that that's that is, I think, you know, uh, quite an amazing. Uh, it's it's just an amazing turnabout. He's not he, his writing is, is is subtle, and so it's not it's not always clear that that's what he's doing. But he is obviously doing it. In any case, I think you're right about what he says about the confessional is a place where I think he is giving this critique of Christianity as having begun something the end point of which he will find um you know objectionable um I, I do think that he he says um you know in in that chapter when one of the chapters where he talks about these things he you know he he says uh he says the se- the the sex of husbands and wife was beset by rules and recommendations the marriage relation was the most intense focus of constraints. It was spoken of more than anything else, more than any other relation. It was required to give a detailed accounting of itself, etc. And then he says, the rest remained a good deal more confused. One only has to think of the uncertain status of sodomy or the indifference regarding the sexuality of children. Now, I mean, I think that, that, um, the Catholic confessional certainly would have included confessions of things like, like sodomy and, and the rest and a really detailed understanding of, of the desires and dreams and intimations that would lead one to commit the sin and, and, and things like that. Um, but he does go on to say that that might have remained within the confines of the confessional had it not been for this kind of um, the advent of, of psychiatric practice and a medicalization of, uh, of such things. Um, So I do think, I I do think it's undeniable that Foucault, um, as you say, thinks that uh, the confessional is the place where, where this is born. But um, I think he thinks that it was, um, that it was, the, 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 that is the tendency to see one's to, to, to self examination, the kind of self examination that that leads to a kind of subjectivization or or a kind of creation of the self uh, in a certain way as as having these kinds of depths and and having an identity. I think he thinks that 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 may well have stayed within the confessional, where it would have been subject to uh, renunciation and and the like, right? Uh, had it not been, uh, had it not been for the, the kind of secularization of, of those, those processes, Mm -hmm. you know, and I I guess I think that, um, that once, once that gets up and running, I do think that Foucault, uh, that Foucault has this, this critique ultimately of, um, of identity, um, certainly of, of identity in, in terms of, um, sexuality and the rest of it and and also a critique of um of the sciences that he he thinks uh, help to you know or, or, or construct these identities so I'm, I'm often puzzled not just by the way that um certain kinds of progressives who have a kind of identity identity politics want to claim Foucault when in, when it seems like he's he's against <laughs> anything like identity um, I, I also find puzzling in a way that I, I'd like to think about some more the way that um, 
social scientists and sociologists and and people in the human sciences uh you know embrace Foucault when you know, I, I think he, he called them dubious sciences and things like that. And I think he thinks that they, they help to construct the realities that they claim to be, you know, merely describing. Yeah. So, I mean, there, there's a lot to say here. One point is yeah. that uh, I, I think, you know, one one sort of provocative takeaway here might be that, you know, whereas uh, a sort of repressive I thought, hypothesis informed um Perspective would assume that there's some polarity or, or opposition between something like the confessional and you know the the sort of discourses that it incites and yes uh, something like say to to give a modern institution um, that I've thought about a little bit in this regard like the LGBT resource center right where yeah if, yeah, if yeah. you look at the websites of these you know of a LGBT resource center and you'll see you know, really a kind of enactment of this like incitement to discourse that, that he's, uh, that he's talking about and, and that these kind of, and, and, you know, you can think about it in terms of like, um, some of these controversies around like what's being taught in schools or what books are available in the libraries, you know, certainly what, what a lot of these things do is a kind of, you know, these kind of prompts to self-examination, these kinds of, um, incitements to, you know, uh, to kind of attach language and terminology to, you know, various kinds of, uh, you know, kind of manifestations of desire. And so, yes. I, you know, I, I think, you know, perhaps one provocative way of putting this would just be that there's a kind of continuity in, in Foucault's account between the confessional and, you know, something like the LGBT resource center or, you know, various other kinds of contexts that are, um, or, you know, say something like gender affirming care, right? That these are, um, that these are in, in this account, entirely continuous developments. Absolutely. And a absolutely. And so for him, you know, the, the, the point of all this, you know, and, and I think one way to, um, one way to see this is simply that anytime there is this attempt to kind of, uh, you know, probe these, these realms of desire and kind of taxonomize and categorize and classify them, you know, on one hand, what you see is a sort of operation of power um, that you know, through the production of, of again, sort of taxonomies, classifications, categories is, is always a, a, it's, it's an operation of power. That's also a production of knowledge. Right. But that yeah. it does, that it, it relies on this, uh, this, um, the, the ascent of those participating, right. Uh, believe, you know, seeing themselves as doing something other than that. Right. In, in, in some in some sense. Right. That, you know, regardless of what form this takes, um, it, it, it requires a kind of purchase like people don't just have this done to them. Right. That um, people are uh, participants in this process. Absolutely. And I think that um, that 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 construction of identity that it, it, I think you're exactly right. It's something that um, that the the subject, you know, herself sort of engages in is something that I think, I imagine that Foucault thinks that under the regime of the confessional, it was the case that, uh, you know, people, people who um, committed the sin of sodomy or had, had inclinations towards sodomy were, were more or less sort of like, you know, certainly they were, they were condemned insofar as they were, they were sinning, but, they were, they were kind of left. I think he kind of thinks of it as they were kind of left alone. It was like, that was just other stuff. What we're interested in is like the sanctity of the marriage bed and, and the procreative couple. That's the identity, right? That's the, that's the thick identity here. And then everything else is just kind of vague. And I think there, there's a, there's a sense, I get a sense when reading Foucault that, 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 you know, maybe in the way that Nietzsche kind of admires things about the master morality Foucault is kind of thinking to himself, yeah, that'd be kind of nice. It'd be kind of good to be left alone in that way. Instead, as you say, um, we get this proliferation, 
creation and proliferation of types where you're exactly right. The, the, the subject herself is like engaged in it. Like we're, we are seeing ourselves in, in these ways and, and thereby sort of, I mean, that, that's why I think the, uh, that's why I think Seinfeld is helpful here. I mean, you know, the idea of things like the close talker and, and the low talker and the sidler and all these, these kinds of, uh, uh, social categories that, um, it's, it's not that they're not descriptive. I mean, they are descriptive and, and one, so, so, so some people do, uh, get too close to other people when they, when they talk, um, and maybe they do it consistently. Um, and, and, and if, if a person came to see themselves as a close talker and then were, um, you know, either consciously or unconsciously aware of the, of the facts that are true of, of, on average of people who are close talkers, one can imagine that they would consciously or unconsciously sort of conform their behavior to those, to those norms thereby making it the case that there really are close talkers who, you know, have, have other things that are true of them, uh, you know, better than average dental hygiene or something like that. Um, and yet we, we wouldn't thereby say that, well, close talkers are a natural kind and you should em embrace your, your inner close talker. And that's what you really are. I mean, we can kind of see that that's, I mean, it's, it's, it's amusing and it's, it's humorous because it's absurd. Um, but I do think that Foucault is at least suggesting that the idea that, that each of us has a, a sexuality that is a deep part of our identity that we then sort of embrace and um, see as part of our identity and, and become in a certain way you know, might, might be equally as, as, as sort of absurd. Now I, I do want to, I do want to say that um, queer theorists have of course taken up the mantle of, 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 of Foucault and, and said, well, this can be used tactically. You know, the identity can be used tactically to gain certain rights and, and, and the rest. And, um, I, I don't know that, that Foucault opposed such uh, tactics, but I think it's really careful. It, it's really important not to, um, I don't know how to put it. Like uh, it, it's almost, I, I would think that given what he says in the history of sexuality, volume one, that that's almost a ruse. Like you don't want to be taken in by your own ruse. Like you don't want to be taken in by the idea that you have this deep identity. You, you can say, look, this is our identity and we're, we want certain, certain rights. Um, as long as you don't come to think that you really do have this identity and it really does characterize you in a deep way, because then whatever rights you might come to have, you've, you've, you've lost, you've lost freedom. You've lost, you, you, you've become the opposite of, uh, of liberated. You, you've become, uh, you know, uh, prison in, in prison by your own uh, by your own tactic or something like that. <laughs> yeah. So there's this process by which, right? And, and this is, I mean, this is kind of a common thread across much of his work, right? That that mm. uh, there's a sort of ruse of liberation or uh, a, a process yes. by which the the very things that you perceive as liberation are the things that, in some sense, entrap you or um, ensnare you, and. You know, I think the the prolific, you know, and and the close talker example. I mean, this is it's great because, and you know, it's funny. In my household, we make these Seinfeld and Larry David jokes all the time. <laughs> you know, where you where you take something and like turn it into a type, like, and before you put it absolutely, in, but it's um, <laughs> I hadn't noticed the relationship, but it's um, yeah, it's absolutely a really uh a really good illustration of how this works and, and how, you know, I, I mean, it's, we're talking about social construction, right? Of, yes. And, and uh, the way that, and, and this is sort of a, you know, it, it's, it's been interesting to see and yeah, sorry to, to make one, one relevant point, you know, you can sort of see this with 
some of these Tumblr identities and things like this hmm. that, uh, I mean, I talked about this a little bit in this piece I wrote a year ago about asexuality, which touches on, on some of these themes, but you know, that, that some of these started as kind of jokes. And I mean, part of what's interesting is like, in a way it is, it is exactly what you're describing. Amazing. Some of these seem to have started as jokes. Like people kind of made up these categories just to yeah. kind of play around with the, the whole thing that they were engaged in doing. Yeah. And then, and then it's sort of, then people started to actually say they were this thing. Right. So a lot of these like weird, I mean, I think one example I give in the, the asexuality piece is called Eureka gender. I can't even remember what it's supposed to be, but you know, a lot of these, if you look up like uh, a lot of these categories, uh, you know, there are many that you'll have never heard of, but they're very sort of earnestly described as, as real and, uh, you know, a sort of meaningful form of identity. But if you look back at how they, they came into being, actually a lot of them were kind of jo- started out as, seemed to have started out as jokes. Right? Another well, example yeah. I've seen come up was this attack helicopter thing, which is like, <laughs> it sort of became this joke, I think on 4chan or somewhere to be like, I identify as an attack helicopter. And then someone wrote a, like a short story that was called something about attack helicopters that, I think was like by somebody who was themselves some sort of gender nonconforming category, but, and they were kind of, um, you know, exploring this joke and identity and so on, but then they ended up getting canceled for like, you know, because this attack helicopter thing had initially been used to kind of ridicule people. And then, and then, but then, you know, there was kind of an interesting thing in one of these leaks from a, from like a gender affirming, clinic for you know teenagers where some kid was described was you know reported as having said like i don't really know what i am maybe i'm an attack helicopter or something like that and this was taken (laughs) as being evidence that this was clearly fake right that this couldn't be real because this is only a term used to ridicule but in fact you know it, it was verified that some kid had actually said this in the course of some clinical consultation and i think there you see how like these jokes and the, you know that this kind of self awareness about this process of by which you're kind of making up and coining these categories can actually be part of the process by which you you know on some level sort of earnestly embrace them right so i think there's there's kind of an interesting way that like the th- the thing you're pointing out where you know, these things that are just a joke that like function as a joke in part because they're so it's so absurd to um, to make this kind of observation into a it's sort of reified into a category. It's like, yes. it's so it's so absurd, but it does seem that that's actually kind of part of what's been happening with this proliferation of categories. Well, well there's something there. I guess there's something in us that wants categories and wants to see ourselves in these identities or something like that. You know, Foucault, of course, famously said that that he didn't think he was the only one to write in order to have no face. But I, but maybe he was the only one who did that because it seems like so many people really, you know, you want to be something. <laughs> you know, we, we, we all have the tendency to want to be something and um, to, to find our slot. And uh, I think that, that you're just right, that, that that's the sort of thing that Foucault was kind of warning against that, that what, what's might seem to be your liberation ends up, ends up being your, your cage. But, but it's even, I mean, the, the asexuality paper, I, I want to say is, is brilliant and, and it's, I, I, I highly recommend it. And I think that, um, you know, what you do with asexuality there really makes me think that, you know, the, the way that asexuality really sort of breaks free from, it, it breaks so 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 that there's as, as you say in the piece it seems as though those who uh, are are experts and here I'm I'm using scare quotes on asexuality say that um, the asexual may well have and enjoy sex uh, that that doesn't count against their identity as asexual um, and 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 that that seems to go to a step further than categories like homosexual where you know, it seems part of the part of the part and parcel of the category that that if you're heterosexual and you have sex with a member of the same sex, that you're going to experience some sort of discomfiture or something like that. Whereas that's just not true for the asexual. The asexual it just it just swings free of any kind of um, 
actual sex, <laughs> which is, uh, which is really quite something. It is, it is, it is just a marker of the, it really is this kind of like not completely Gnostic or I don't know if even that's the right way to think about it, but, but just a, just a categorization that really it's a sexuality that, that really does swing free of sex, uh, which is, is really pretty wild. Um, yeah, I mean, something that often strikes me is that there's kind of this, um, you know, and, and I've, this is a more, uh, speculative line of thinking. I haven't, haven't really tested out before, but I'm curious what you think of it, that it's as if there's kind of a, a theological quality to all of this kind of discourse that's been yeah. produced and incited, which simply has to do with like, if, if you look at this, uh, you know, what people are trying to describe here, it really is in a way trying to describe what, what can't be represented or what can't be pinned down. And so it's, it's kind of uh, it's an attempt to kind of approach the ineffable, right? So when you hear these descriptions of like, well, you know, Mm. this, this is a sexuality or it's a gender that like, you know, floats around and like sometimes looks like one thing and sometimes looks like another. It's like, (laughs) it sounds like you're trying, you're trying to describe essentially like what, by definition can't be described, right? Which are what is beyond language. And so it's as if there's kind of a, a sort of apophatic quality to it or something. Oh, it's very interesting. And I, I don't know, that's, that's something I've, I've wondered about where it, it, it becomes theological it, precisely in the sense that it's this attempt to approach something that's, you know, is kind of sacralized, but also is, is sort of seen as, as unapproachable or, or only, you know, can only kind of vaguely be approximated. Well, you know, I mean, it's, it, I mean, it is interesting that, that, uh, in some ways, some of this stuff, like e- even in their worst caricatures, the, uh, the scholastics weren't this bad, you know, with, uh, with kind of trying to, to, uh, you know, m- make these <laughs> minute distinctions and have different categories of, of, as you say, something that is, is in its essence, the, di- if, if we're talking about the divine, something that isn't going to be fully conceptualizable. And, uh, the, I guess the, I mean, if insofar as as the identity uh, language is trying to get at something that, or or if they take themselves to be get trying to get at something that that's ineffable, in, in a certain sense, it 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 ends up being for them at least sort of self defeating. It just kind of goes away because uh, um, now you're you're back to something. You're back to individuality. <laughs> you know, um, it, it, my my identity is something that is is, uh, you know, I, I want to give it a category, but it's, it's so, um, it's, you might even say unique. (laughs) And if it's unique, then, then we're no longer going to be able to talk about it in, in these identity terms and in, in, at least in terms of, uh, any kinds of universals you might think. Right. So, and that is kind of why these, these documents where there are these kind of endless enumerations of different categories are, you know, quite fascinating because it it is the kind of breakdown of of the possibility of universals, right? Um, you know, and and you see this in like this idea where somebody says like I'm, you know, Erica gender or whatever, where it's like your gender is just you, but then yeah, yeah. So you know, which and I mean, the, if you think of the etymology of gender, right, it it implies some kind of gen. You know, it's related to things like general and like it, it implies some kind of generalizability, right? Absolutely. So it really is this kind of breakdown of, of categories into pure singularities. Um, and so the process of trying to generate, um, you know, adequate categories actually leads to the categories no longer uh, being viable at all. You know, I've, I've wondered about this, Jeff, do you think, I mean, Sometimes when I'm when I'm reading Foucault, I wonder, um, you know, I take it that he wouldn't deny that that people have settled tendencies to prefer, you know, members of the opposite sex, say, when uh, pursuing uh, sexual relationships or something like that, right? Um, or, or or the same sex, um, and and I take it that. I mean, maybe he would deny that, but, but it seems like that's a tough one to deny. Of course, that doesn't, it doesn't mean then that the person has a sexual identity or um, a sexuality that that's sort of a, that, that plays a different role. Um, 
you know, as, as I, I think illustrated in the case of the close talker, rather than somebody who just happens to get close or just gets close to people, just has this tendency. But, but given, I mean, if, if, if we say, well, th- there are these, um, there are these sexual orientations in a certain, in a certain sense, I guess I wonder, you know, is there, uh, is Foucault, I mean, th- there, so, so I don't think that he's giving a caricature because I think that, uh, th- that as we've, as we've shown, th- there's, there's nothing so, so wild or crazy that it doesn't exist. Um, and also I think that there is this sense in which people take their sexuality to be some deep and immutable fact about themselves. But I wonder, do you think that, um, so, so I think he's, he's, he's rejecting those things. Do you think that he could, that he could, he could allow for the, the more humdrum sort of idea of, you know, look, I'm, I'm, I'm pretty much straight and, you know, et cetera. Uh, I mean, I guess, or, or, or do you think that with his, the notion of bodies and pleasures that he's pushing us toward this idea that like, look, e- even that way of thinking about things is, um, you know, it's, 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 it's too much because goodness knows what would bring you pleasure if you used your body in, in certain ways. And it might have nothing to do with, uh, you know, the, the sex of the person with whom you're engaged or something like that. Yeah. Well, I think in some ways, I mean, going back to some things you've, you've said, it seems as if he, you know, it, to the extent that he might, um, be more positively disposed, you know, and, and people have observed this about various things like that, you know, that there's some crude way you can read discipline and punish where he kind of thinks like hmm. the sort of b- more brutal, <laughs> but less pervasive modes by which yeah. power was established in earlier eras were, were in some sense preferable because at least the good old they days, left, right. The, at least they, they kind of <laughs> yeah. left a lot outside of their ambit. Right. And so the yeah. same goes for this sort of older idea of sodomy, right? Where, I mean, if you get caught and it's like certain circumstances hold, then, you know, I guess that's bad. Uh, <laughs> but, but overall it, it, the, the assumption is there's a lot of what's going, a lot of stuff that's going on that like, isn't really being dealt. The power just isn't interested in. Right. Right. So, right. So that is a kind of, you know, it's at least a kind of negative freedom in the, in the sense of like power simply doesn't extend its ambit very far. Right. And so there's just a lot of stuff going on out there that isn't really, uh, that, and you know, and this is, I, I mean, I don't think he ever says it this way, but it's, it's in a basic sense true that just like there, the, that the, the operations of the state, and of, you know, sort of state, like whatever, you know, what his teacher al Sarah called ideological state apparatuses. Mm. I mean, these are very limited in, in pre-modern times. Right. Um, yep. and so th- there's just Absolutely. a lot out there that, um, that wasn't, uh, that wasn't subject to the, the operations of the state. And so, you know, p- part of what it seems like he, he thinks is, um, you know, yes, there's some, you know, probably intuitive level on which all this took place, but it's notable that like, you know, there, there weren't any classifications for it, which suggests that there wasn't really an interest in it, which means in his account that there wasn't really a, a need or an impulse or whatever to exercise power over it. Right. And so yeah. it could kind of just exist. And I, I, you know, so I think that's, um, and it's, it's interesting. Like there are some points in his, um, I I mean, it's sort of, sort of congruent, but that there are some points if, if you read his biographies where like people did kind of ask him, you know, when he was suddenly in San Francisco and in this kind of, uh, you know, floridly open sort of gay culture, yeah, which he did participate in with enthusiasm um nonetheless sure. like when people asked him about it and how he felt about it compared to kind of earlier times in his life he said you know he he did remark things like well you know there were some good things about the older times like 
you know, we just kind of had our own little secret world and like people didn't bother us as long as, as long as like nothing out of the ordinary happens, like we were just kind of left alone and like we had our own little world we could inhabit. And, you know, there was a kind of intimacy to that, that, you know, doesn't exist in the same way in this more kind of open world. And so, I mean, he did kind of have this and, you know, it's not, it's not that it's like a, a, a common remark you hear. Uh, from, you know, from certain people who have kind of lived through different phases of like gay life to, to say, well, yeah, there were some nice things about yeah. like, the, the more closeted era. Um, there are some things I miss about it. Like I've heard other people say that both, you know, publicly and like in, in private conversation. And so, I mean, he did, I, you know, I'd say that's kind of like a more anecdotal and and kind of casual version of this idea that like, yeah, that, that, you know, as, Absolutely. as power expands its operation and knowledge, um, you know, continues to kind of attempt to, to survey more and more, um, you know, there is this kind of, um, you know, and, and so as you, as you exist more and more under this panoptic gaze that you, that you are, are not just subject to, right. It's not just done to you. It's something that you internalize and, you know, that, that becomes part of how you exist in the world that that there is kind of a loss there and so you know when we when we try to say like well you know is there just some normal level on which these kind of natural categories exist yeah you know perhaps one answer is well yes but like the the very fact that we're sort of so interested in that and asking it is is maybe a kind of illustration of the way we've sort of internalized this uh this way of existing I, 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 I take your point and I think that that's, I, I, I do tend to think that that's right. I mean, it, it would seem that um, Foucault, you know, in, in, sometimes in trying to think about what his positive view is or what his, I mean, not positive view isn't quite the right way to put it, but, but something like that. I mean, you know, I think, well, obviously he doesn't think that human beings have, you know, an, an essence or a, we, we don't have any individual natures or anything like that. But then I think, well, can he at least admit that we have, um, you know, and, and certainly we don't have natures, individual natures that can be, they're not metaphysical natures, but they're also not like sort of scientifically verifiable natures or biological natures that sort of give us the, the identities that we have or something like that. So he wants to, obviously wants to reject those. But then I, I, I sometimes wonder, well, can he admit though that we do individually have certain tendencies? I guess the idea is, any admission is going to be, there's going to be a temptation to have that as one's identity in some sense, to take that to be normative for one. And, and that's what he, he seems to want to, he seems to be so wary of, which makes me sometimes think, boy, I, I don't know if he, does he really escape the ambit of Sartre? Like, is he, is he sort of like an existentialist? Is he saying like, look, you know, you're, you, you're, you're wanting to think of yourself as a thing. And in fact, you have this, you are, you're nothing, <laughs> you're, you're freedom, you're, you're, uh, but, but surely, surely that, that seems to harken back to the bad humanism or something like that. Um, so I, I, then I get lost a little bit about where, and I, maybe, maybe this is, I, I know I'm not, I'm not alone in thinking that, you know, there is this sort of lacuna at the, at the heart of things for, for Foucault, so, Sorab's uh, essay you know, sort of touches, touches on this, his big essay, um, on Foucault recently in contact talking about the way that it's, it's not clear what the, where, where we're supposed to plant our feet when we, when we make these critiques, right. It's, if it's not going to be in, you know, in, in something like the dig, the dignity we have is created in the image of God, or at least in the, the nothingness that we are uh, uh, Sartrean in Sartrean freedom. You kind of wonder like, where are we in making these, these critiques, but maybe that's the wrong question. I don't know. You know, maybe he's going to say, look, there's no, you're asking me for a big theory. You're asking me for a, you're asking me for something bigger than, than, uh, than need be given or really can be given. Like I'm, I'm, I'm starting where I am. And that's, that's, and and in fact, maybe Foucault would say that's where you start too, whether or not you, you want to admit that, you know, I I don't know if that's, 
the kind of answer he would want to give, but it just doesn't seem like he has the kind of, um, even the kind of, I don't know, programmatic view of a Nietzsche, even, you know, it's, it's, uh, which, which for, uh, for, for, for us philosophers can be frustrating. You know, we want, we want, we want to know <laughs> what's his, what is your, what is your theory? But uh, maybe that's not the, the way to approach him. Right. I mean, there is sort of the question of, you know, you mentioned before that he, he sort of, uh, embraced by and, and, you know, brought into the social sciences, but, you know, in some sense that's kind of a realm he was, was quite suspicious of, uh, you know, he's, he's unclear. He, he doesn't sort of read easily in disciplinary terms in terms of what sort of category he fits into. Mm. Um, and, you know, and he does kind of tend to approach things, you know, historically and archivally kind of from the the level of, um, you know, trying to chart out a particular or, you know, as he puts it archaeologically, right, where right. there's sort of an attempt to investigate the, the evolution of a particular kind of discourse. Um, and and so he's. He's not, um, as you said, in some sense, offering a kind of grand, uh, you know, theoretical framework that can necessarily be sort of applied more broadly. Although he does have kind of, you know, I mean, if you read like the archaeology of knowledge, there is a kind of methodological uh, argument or, or approach that's outlined there. At the same time, he does sure. also kind of, in some sense, distance himself from that um, in his later work so yes you know sometimes i think jeff that maybe maybe this is what we can blame him for we, we can blame him if, if if this is if this is blameworthy or if it's a bad thing the uh the idea that you know intellectuals don't have to plant their feet anywhere you know that you're you're just doing you're just doing local local work working on local problems and um you know you don't need a you don't need a view you don't need a, a foundation for that and, um, you know, maybe, maybe he helps to usher in, in that age, you know, this kind of Richard Rorty idea that like, look, the idea of searching for foundations is, is passe and it's, it's, it, it's not helpful. I mean, what we need to do is to, is, is to work on these local problems, which is all well and good until you start to disagree on, on what, what are problems, <laughs> you know, is, is this a problem or a, or a feature? And, and then it seems like you have to kind of move back a step, but. Um, that might be a sense in which, I mean, you know, I think there are those who uh, think that's a, a virtue of Foucault is that he's not obsessed with these, these big, you know, overarching in, in maybe in their estimation, unanswerable questions that rather he's, he's taking on these, uh, you know, these, these, these more local concerns. But uh, I just, I, I'm not so sure that that way of going is ultimately sustainable. <laughs> Yeah, speaking for myself, I, you know, coming up through literary s studies and comparative literature, I found his influence frustrating in this regard. And that mm. I think it did kind of create this, um, this lack of interest in kind of larger systematic questions. And it, it created this, I mean, it, you know, concretely, it, he was influential on, you know, what's called new historicism, mm. which, you know, essentially is, uh, I mean, it's new historic, older historicism tended to be, you know, you took a literary text and then tried to fill in the, the sort of entire, you know, historical, uh, world in which it came into being. Right. Um, whereas the new yes. historicism, you know, essentially took, with Foucault kind of discourse and texts as primary and saw, you know, the project as kind of constructing these archeological or sort of genealogical kind of archival constellations. Yes. That, um, and, and so, you know, the like parody version of this is, I don't know, it's like you 
read Shakespeare by like, you know, <laughs> digging up a bunch of like shopping lists and like random sort of <laughs> just random, seemingly insignificant documents from this period and and then kind of placing them into some ingenious kind of textual relationship with these. And, right. that, and that, that they're, you know, whereas the older historicism tended to see the literary text as, you know, the thing, right, that we cared about because it, it was the thing that kind of rose above its era, right? And so you just had to fill in the background. The new historicism, in a sense, kind of dethroned the literary text and kind of saw it as just one text within this larger kind of world of text that circulated. And so, and and it tended to be very sort of agnostic about, um, you know, every everything was sort of rel historically relative and culturally relative. And, you know, you're essentially doing this kind of localized anthropology of literary texts, like in within this kind of historical moment that they emerged. And I mean, there are good, ver like there are versions of that that are compelling and, you know, some good books that, that came out of, of that approach. But um, I found overall it kind of, I mean, it it's raised a lot of questions about, and, you know, interestingly, like Foucault himself was, you know, again, speaking to his disciplinary ambiguity, like he was, you know, I'd say genuinely a sort of appreciator of literature, right? He really loved writers like Beckett and, uh, you know, various, uh, yes. various important um French writers of the 20th century and he he did really see literature as a as a fundamental um as, you know as as a as a kind of realm of experience <coughs> that was distinctive and important I I would say whereas I think a lot of this Absolutely. new source of stuff was kind of about relativizing literature and just seeing it as all text right everything is just text and um and all these texts are just different um you know, kind of manifestations of like the power relations within the societies that they emerged out of. And so, I don't know. I mean, I found a lot that was kind of limiting about that approach. I mean, in part because it was, I suppose it was kind of waning already, but it was kind of the dominant or had been the dominant approach for a couple decades when I entered into grad school. And so, yeah, I mean, I, I would, I would, I, I would, I would concur with your, with that particular blame narrative um and you know <laughs> glad it, we could blame it, somebody yeah. here today. <laughs> it's good yeah for something yeah but you know but on the other hand i think in some sense it was it, it had a lot to do with how he ended up being kind of adopted into these other realms mm. and kind of used to to forge new academic a new academic consensus that you know could uh create the careers of a new generation of scholars. And I don't know. I mean, he, he proved very useful for that, that purpose. You know, it's funny. My, my introduction to Foucault in, in graduate school was in some ways, um, it, it was, it was a, sorry, I, I guess, I guess, um, you know, the, the idea was uh, you had to make the argument, one had to make the argument that Foucault was a philosopher, that he should be read by philosophers at all. I mean, that's what Gary Gutting did at, at Notre Dame, um, you know, by, by uh, in, in his estimation and, and, and you know, modestly and humorously trying to make him as unsexy as possible. Like, you know, he was just sort of like boiling it all down and making it sort of, uh, you know, understandable and Anglo-American you know, normy philosophical terms in many, in many cases. But, but I do think that, that he recognized that it's something that you, you had said before, and that you, you, I think have written some about that, that Foucault saw in, in literature, you know, th this opening onto, uh, onto the ineffable or something like that, a kind of, uh, you know, opening to the Dionysian or um, something that, that, that was capable of, you know, if, if there was anything that was capable of, of breaking free of, of, you know, the conceptual cages in which we find ourselves, it's, it's something like, you know, a certain kind of, of, of literature and, and maybe, and maybe some, you know, some darker, <laughs> darker forces than literature might, might allow for such a, Dionysian kind of experience, but it does seem like there's, there's something there that, uh, you know, if there's anything beyond the merely local for Foucault, it would seem to lie in something like literature and, and these experiences of the limit and all the, all the rest. 
I know you've, you've said some things and written some things about that. So, yeah. Yeah, no, I think I, you know, and, and I do, um, I do recommend listeners check out their check out uh, the biography of him by James Miller that I think focuses heavily on this, which I definitely found quite, uh, quite enriching. And, and yeah, it does focus on the kind of through line of the interest in the Dionysian, the, the limit experience, you know, which he draws from the work of Bataille and mm. this kind of, um, and you know, it, it goes back to what I was saying before about, I think if you, say, <laughs> if you, if you think about these, uh, these kind of catalogs of identities <laughs> and so on, it's like, there is some way in which this is an attempt to kind of ensnare these kind of limit realms of experience into something into, yeah. into these. And, and part of what's interesting here is yeah. that it's, it's being done, you know, from the ground up and, and sort of, uh, I, you know, I, I think I said in a previous episode that there would be an interesting juxtaposition to be done between like something like Kraft Ebing's uh, Psychopathia Sexualis, mm. you know, which is like this long catalog of <laughs> pervert, of essentially perversions, right? Um, yes. And, you know, to compare that to, which is exactly, you know, the kind of thing that Foucault is interested in because it marks this point at which all the, I mean, again, all these things that just weren't really of interest particularly, right, except in, in sort of rare cases, you know, suddenly become the subject of intense concern. And, um, you know, there are these endless catalogs and, and where, you know, if you have some particular inclination to some like weird, uh, you know, <laughs> weird sexual habit or something like that's seen as in some way defining, like as defining you. Absolutely. Right. Not just yep. something you do. And so then, yep. you know, these kind of catalogs of people saying like, I'm such and such gender are kind of this weird uh, 21st century version of that. But, you know, at this point, they, they don't have to do with the, the act, right? They just have to do with kind of trying to pin down some, some essence, right? Or some, some realm that is, is fundamentally on, and that, that the people who develop these even will say this, right? That it's like, it's, it's, it's ultimately kind of impossible to capture, but this is a sort of approximation of it is what a lot of these terms kind of amount to. And there's all, there's all this anxiety on the part of the people who are engaging in this to try to figure out what what they are. You know, you, 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 like it's 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 tragic in some ways. They're trying to tr sort of determine like what am I or who am, not just who am I, but what am I? You know, like wh where do I where do I fit in this in this whole thing? And and trying to catalog themselves and their their desires in a way that would make those. Uh, those confessors blush, you know, like <laughs> you'd kind of think that they're, they're really doing the work of trying to, to um, do this kind of hermeneutics of trying to figure out exactly how they should interpret themselves so that they can put themselves in, into one of these, into one of these, these boxes. And it's, um, I, I think there really is a great irony there. And I think that maybe, maybe you're right that the, the reason that Foucault was so exercised about this was that, it may well be that he thought that that sex was one of those um, areas of life that could open up onto these limit experiences and, and that this was, this was pushing in the opposite direction or something like that. It was, it was, um, you know, trying to rationalize what could otherwise be something that would open up onto the, something like the transcendent uh, or something like that. I, I don't, I don't know, but, but I, but I do also think that, that's, that I have a tendency as a philosopher to want to find out, you know, to want to find like the, the foundational key for the, uh, for the thinker. And so I want to think sometimes that, uh, oh, well, it's these limit experiences. So everything else that he's done is somehow related to his desire for these limit experiences. And I remember, uh, you know, Gary Gutting uh, saying like, look, Sometimes a cigar is just a cigar, you know, sometimes it's just, uh, he's, he's just doing the work here. He's interested in this, this thing. And, and that doesn't mean that he's, you know, interested in the prisons because he wants a limit experience in, in criminality or something like that. You know, it might just be that he was upset at the way that the prisoners were being treated and, and wanted to do something about it and to, to study it. And so, I have to, as, as a philosopher, have to sometimes say like, okay, wait, you know, maybe, 
maybe uh, maybe I ought to be a little more localized in in my my reading and not try to put it into the not try to systematize the it into the whole or something like that. So maybe to to finish up, I mean, one implication of of your piece, I would sort of read as I would read it, but also, uh, you know, of our conversation maybe is that he he wasn't quite right about where things were going. That you know, yeah, he, I think he he saw, you know, again, I I mentioned that idea of like the image of man kind of being washed away on the sand. I mean, I suppose there's some way you could this would open up way too many different, but we could talk about like transhumanism <laughs> and things like that. But even there, I think that there's a lot there that would kind of embody the things he's, he's most suspicious of. Um, but you know, what's kind of interesting to me is that he, he does seem to see um, a kind of movement away from these tendencies that he map, you know, that he kind of maps out in various areas of the modern world. And instead, it, it seems as if we've seen more of an intensification, you know, so he like in diagnosing the repressive hypothesis, it's as if he thinks that we can move beyond this kind of framework and perhaps, you know, uh, th this will at some point give way to this other paradigm of bodies and pleasures or whatever. But, you know, it's, it's do you think he's, he ends up being kind of wrong in his prognosis? Is he... Does he not? Um, does he not quite grasp the the sort of trajectory that, that that he's describing in terms of where it's actually going? Or how do you see it? That's so interesting. You know, I, I it, it, it's it's a bit hard to say. I mean, I, I mean, obviously, this is another huge <laughs> topic to go into. But you know, the, the stuff that he says about biopower is certainly. Uh, I think that part is. Um, is, is uh, prophetic in many ways that uh, you know, and, and we need not go into the whole thing, but 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 the idea that um, that um, power will seek to uh, will will seek in in ostensibly at least to serve life and and to uh, to 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 perpetuate and prolong and and protect life, even if it if it means uh, you know locking everybody in their houses for for uh, long periods of time or, or whatever else. So, so I think that there, that, that there he may well be um, somewhat more prophetic than, than in the, in the case of, of um, sexuality and the rest. Although, you know, I don't know. I, I, I sort of, I guess maybe I read him as, 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 le as less sort of um, predicting that, that we, we will overcome this uh, as much as, as and maybe more as, <laughs> as expressing the the hope that one day we'll come to see these things uh see these things differently but i but i think that you're right that you know the um it, it's it's more i think at the end of the essay you know i talk about what he says about dh lawrence and and the way that you know I'm paraphrasing well he paraphrases he, he he quotes lawrence as saying that now our business is to realize sex and that that it's the fully conscious realization of sex is more important than the act itself. And Lawrence is saying that, and, and, uh, you know, Foucault expresses a, a, a hope for a different kind of future, but, but it does seem as though, you know, Lawrence's view has won out. I mean, you know, the, some of the stuff you say in the, the asexuality piece sort of bears this out. I mean, about the way that, uh, you know, people are just having much less sex, even that even, uh, according to, uh, according to what you quoted there, that masturbation is, uh, is on the decline. It's, it's not even, it's not even that sexual, it's not just sexual intercourse. It's, and you sort of think, wow, that's just wild. Like, I guess, but it doesn't seem like people's interest in defining themselves in terms of their sexual proclivities, however unrealized has, has abated at all. Uh, you know, that, that seems to have taken off. Um, so, so, uh, but, but I, I guess I'm not, I'm not sure. I'm not sure that uh, Foucault was wrong so much as he, uh, he, he, he was expressing a hope or something like that, but who knows? I'm, maybe I'm being too, uh, too kind to him there. 
Yeah, it's almost as if there's a kind of <coughs> attempt to liberate, you know, not to liberate sex now, but to liberate, <laughs> to be liberated from it in, in some way that, you know. And, Absolutely. And I think, you know, this the is liberates, part of like, <laughs> yeah, sexuality from sex. I want, yeah. I, want, I want to be very interested in sexuality, but the whole sex thing, you know, that's not so so much. It seems like that's the <laughs> that's sort of the mood of the day or something. Yeah. Yeah. And so, you know, perhaps there's something there about how, you know, that there is even, even you know, it, it, it makes me think despite the, you know, and, and I, I, I feel like I tried to convey this in the asexuality piece a bit that, you know, that there is something kind of reason, even though it, a lot of when you read about it, it sort of seems insane. There's, <laughs> there's like an aspect of it that, you know, it's, it's as if it's an attempt to kind of, just on a basic level, like detach yourself from yes. what has clearly become a, a sort of oppressive and yes. un, you know obviously unhealthy set of dynamics, and so it it, yep. it attempts a kind of secession or or a kind of self distancing from you know all of these these dynamics to which you're enjoined by all kinds of forces. Right. And so it, it, it feels Absolutely. as if, you know, despite my general instinct to kind of make fun of these things, you know, perhaps there is something <laughs> sort of positive and positive to be found in them. I mean, wouldn't it be amazing to say, like w when asked about your sexuality to say, oh, I don't have one. Yeah, I don't. I just don't have a sexuality. I, you know, I don't exactly know what you're talking about there. And, and insofar as I do, I don't want to participate <laughs> that would be a pretty, uh, pretty amazing way to go. And insofar as that's what the asexuality discourse is doing, but of course, you know, as, as you, as you lay out in that piece, it, it kind of gets co-opted by the very forces that want to, uh, want to categorize everything and, uh, and articulate everything and all the rest of it. And so it's, uh, it, it's, it's really, it's, it's tough to remain on the, the margins <laughs> or to, 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 uh, renounce that, that, that sort of way of thinking. Well, yeah. he, you know, Foucault at the end of his piece on the, uh, what is the author, which is, mm. uh, one we haven't, haven't really discussed on the show, but I do recommend to people is, you know, he, he, uh, concludes it with this line, I think from Beckett, which is what does it matter who is speaking? Right. And so, and he sees yeah. that as kind of a hope, you know, it's, it's, it's in line with the point, yes. about, you know, the, the 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 sort of figure of man disappearing like yes being washed away on the beach so this kind of um this possibility of a kind of indifference right that you can achieve uh what does it matter who is speaking um i think you know we mm. might <laughs> i suppose in a similarly hopeful way imagine a kind of future indifference of the sort that you're that you're uh pointing to I, I do think that that's the, it, it does seem to me that that's the, insofar as I can discern one, the, the hope that he's, uh, that he's, that he's putting, putting forward here. I think that's just right. All right. Well, probably a good place to wrap up. So thanks so much, David, uh, both for your contribution uh, and for uh, taking the time to talk. This was really great. Thank you very much, Jeff. I really appreciate it. So people, if you have not, please check out David's piece on why Foucault couldn't kill sexuality. And if you're not already a subscriber, please go to compactmag.com slash subscribe to be able to read everything we publish, including perhaps future contributions from David. <laughs> and if you uh, enjoy what you're hearing, please uh, subscribe to Blame Theory on your favorite channels and rate and review us. So thanks again, David, and thanks, listeners. See you next time.